Thank you, Bruce. Happy Sabbath, everyone. For some of you, I just saw last week. How's everybody doing? For some of you, I haven't seen in a while. Again, same question. How are you doing? Doing well? Good. Good. For those online, welcome. Welcome to Sabbath services this week. As I'm sitting back there thinking, you know what, it's probably a good idea to go, I went first today. It's kind of like the Feast of Tabernacles when all the, the speakers get ready. It's like, who's going first? What are they going to talk about? And it's like Pentecost week is a shorter version. It's like, oh, maybe it's a good idea. I am going first. I don't have to make any adjustments on the fly. I can just give my message and go sit down and be done. <laughs> so, again, welcome everybody. And happy Sabbath to you. And happy Pentecost weekend. Last week when I got home from Syracuse, I started putting this message together, and I realized when I spoke last week here, I had a lot more to talk about. Always happens. So I thought, why not make it a part two? Continue what I talked about last week. And if you are not able to see that, sorry. <laughs> but it was just so much, it was so much information, I, and I, it's just important information, especially this, this weekend, Pentecost weekend. So I will apologize up front if I go into places where Steve's thought about going or Bruce thinks about going tomorrow. But it's just so important to understand what we have from God and the great blessing and what, what we're going through in this time. We all know what we're going through, that the world's going through, the fear that can be ramped up, the misinformation that can be ramped up. As God's people... We're here. We're sitting here. We're watching. And I touched base on that last week. Here we are, seeing these things happen around us. Go to Ezekiel. Let's, I'm going to start in Ezekiel first. Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, verse 29. Ezekiel 18, verse 29 says, Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair, and your ways which are not fair? And we talked about that last week a little bit, what God sees. And we talked about looking through God's eyes last week. The world says, no, your way's not fair. Your ways are wrong, God. We'll do it our way. Of course, the backdrop behind that is Satan has control of most of this world, has deceived the world, basically to spit on God's word, to do away with it. What do you mean I should keep a seventh-day Sabbath? That's unfair. What do you mean I shouldn't murder innocent lives? That's unfair. What do you mean I can't love who I want to love and be with who I want to be with? That's unfair. We see this in our world. What do you mean we were given dominion over the world in Genesis? No, we need to bow down to Mother Nature and please Mother Nature so she doesn't get us with a virus. We see these mentalities out in the world. We see these things that are so against God. It says in verse 30, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. That's God's plan. He wants humankind to live. 
He wants humankind to obey and have pleasure in his ways. That's his plan. Think for a moment. Can you imagine this world if there could be found no truth of God in it? What if you and I hadn't been called? What if you and I didn't know about the truth of God? Just imagine that for a moment. It's a what if scenario. This world might have been gone a long time ago with the hate, the deceit, the violence, the murder, the ways of man. But praise God, that's not the way it's, it is. Praise God that it, that is not his plan. His plan is to call out people, his people, out of Egypt. As we talk about in the days of unleavened bread, we see that physical example. His plan is to call people out of this world. That's you and I. And it's the people throughout history, his people throughout history. When he called Abraham out of his land, said, leave that land and go to a land I, I'm going to give you. The example of the Exodus. I'm calling my people out, he says, out of Egypt, out of sin, into a land that I promised you. And when he called on all the prophets, you know, called upon the people that he chose throughout history, the human beings that he's called and planted in their minds his truth and his ways, that is his plan. To call out a people, and in this day and age, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to call out his people and give them his spirit. His spirit. As the world and as our country and our states and around us are in chaos, lacking direction, lacking focus because they've been deceived, not to look in the right place. We've been given a great gift. A gift from the Father that helps us. 2 Corinthians 4. And today these scriptures are going to be familiar. And again, I don't mean to step on toes with other messages that follow. But this is the time of God's calendar where we revisit his great gift to his people. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. As God's people, we need to remind ourselves it's not because of us. If we were right back in the world, we would be in the world. If we hadn't been called, we wouldn't be here today. We'd be out maybe shopping, going to the, you know, going to the store, mowing our yard, or involving ourselves in worldly things. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We sit here and we watch the world. Some things may perplex us. Oh, that's interesting. So we go to God and say, let's see, why is this happening? We're not in despair. We shouldn't be in despair. We, ask, we pray and ask for answers. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. He's our example. He's our great example that we look at, our guidepost. What, what did he do on this earth? What would he want us to do on this earth now? For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So, that, so then death is working in us, but life in you. 
And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And here we have Paul. These are Paul's writings, and I've said this before. Paul writes these letters to the churches that he's visited, that he helped build up, and he knows are facing things in their world, temptations, facing trials in their world. He's telling them, you can't lose heart. You can't lose heart. Our inward man is being renewed day by day. The spirit that was given to us by our Father in heaven. And he continues and says, for, a light, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Those great blessing from the Father and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2. Paul writes in this letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith is in God. We rely on God. We talked a little bit about that last week. What does God see through his eyes? Does he see his people relying on him, trusting him, giving it over to him? That's what he asks. That's what he tells us. You, you know, you follow me, I will be there with you, he says. That's the promise. It's not the wisdom of men. We can see where wisdom of men Get this country, get this world. We see what happens. But in the power of God. Blessings from having the Spirit of God. Understanding what's happening. Because it's revealed to us through His Spirit. Hebrews 13 Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We can boldly say that. We have that faith and we have that trust in our Savior, our Father. Verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away, excuse me, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. He is saying, let's not lose our focus. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this jumped out to me, kind of what I said last week. If it's looking through God's eyes, 
we have his spirit. If it's not of God, then it's of the world. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If it's something different today than it was in the past, then it's not of God in his words, in his way. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. Our focus needs to be on the truth that we've been taught. The truth that has been shown to us. 2 Peter chapter 1. Because the plan's been the same. We have so many examples as we read through Scripture. So many examples of what God has done in the past, our past, that can point to what He is going to do in the future. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter 1, verse 16. And this is Peter talking, another apostle of Christ. Peter speaking in 2 Peter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Can you imagine what they saw? Can you imagine sitting there, standing there next to Jesus Christ in person. Of course, during when, before he died and was resurrected and before he came, you know, went up, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. So maybe they didn't quite understand what they were seeing. Seeing those fishes coming out of that basket right, left, up, and, you know, and the loaves of bread being pulled out. Seeing the miracles that were happening before their eyes. See, this is Peter writing this after all this stuff. He's telling you, you, we're not giving you fables. We're telling you we saw these things. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. These words have made it to us today. Not only was Peter writing these letters to the churches of the time, these words have made it to us to inspire us, to keep us going, to help us understand what we have in God and in Jesus Christ. Our Savior even says in John 17... We reread this the night of the Lord's Supper, but it goes with John 17. John 17, I'd like to start in verse 14. John 17, verse 14. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. He's talking about his apostles. John, Peter, Andrew, James, eventually Paul, the one born out of season. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. What just Peter, what we just read in Peter. He says, I'm a, I was an eyewitness. I am telling you of his majesty, of his glory. We were there. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. A prayer for us. Called out people. That would be called out centuries later. 2,000 years later. And throughout that time period, throughout that history, those who have been called out since and up until now. 
We believe and we trust because we have faith in the writings that we read and the teachings that we've heard, the true teachings. And it shows us that he is there for us. Our Savior is there for us and our Father is there for us. Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul writes, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap. If we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So Paul's being that cheerleader again, say, Don't be deceived. Do the spirit, you know, do the things in the spirit, not of man, not of the world. Do the things of the spirit. Don't sow according to flesh. Sow according to the spirit. And what's the reward? We will reap everlasting life. And Paul was always good about saying, don't grow weary while doing good. Because in due season, we shall reap. You know? We may be at the doorstep of everlasting life. 10 years, 15 years. We may well be. Things are lining up. But it's God's way, it's, it's up to God to cut time short, to extend time. So we cannot grow weary in what we do, and we have the Spirit to help and guide us. Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, verse 29. It says, He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For those who wait on the Lord, who trust the Lord, who turn it to Him, wherever we may be, whenever we may be, trust in the Lord. So many examples of that in God's scriptures and His Holy Word. You know, just before they left Egypt, the Lord God protected His people in Goshen. That's where they were located at the time. All they had to do was listen and obey. What do we need to survive? You know, Lord God, He told them, kill the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. And I will pass over you. All the listen and obey. One of the greatest examples we can read about and understand. If you do this, I'm there to take care of you and guide you and pull you out. All you have to do is trust in me and obey me. I will get you where you need to be. Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verse 1. Here's Paul writing to the church in Colossae. Same thing's going on. 
some turmoils going on, some trials befalling them, temptations there. And here's Paul to encourage them, to guide them to where they need to be, to focus where their mind should be focused on. Colossians 2, verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And Paul saying, I'm not there. I, what, maybe, you know, I'm not there. I'm not there, but I'm hearing what you're doing. I'm praying for you that you continue to be steadfast. You know, he's saying we're brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he's saying there. Although I'm not there physically, I'm praying for you and I know you can do it. I know you can overcome. In verse 6, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Paul's talking to those people in Colossae, teaching them from a distance in his letter, don't give up, be steadfast, don't be deceived by things that are not of Christ or not of God. Don't be deceived. Don't let that come in. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Second Peter 3, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will burn up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's a powerful question that Peter brings up. That's a powerful question. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, burning on fire, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for, for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as, our also, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. So these letters are going back and forth between the churches, from Paul, from Peter, from John. They're saying the same thing. Are we picking that up? They were sent out with a mission from Christ himself. Go and help these people. Go and teach these people. And he said, and Peter, that's a prophecy, like, it's almost like a prophecy here in, with Peter. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Peter knew, and Paul knew, they knew that their words would be twisted and be taught in a different manner. Oh, that's not what it says. That's not what that really says. You know, those kind of things. 
He says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. So why, why go through these scriptures? Why talk about these things? What's in it for us? As I made mention, these letters were sent to the Christians of that day. The new Christians, the babes of Christ. To encourage them, to keep them going, to keep them steadfast. The apostles knew that if they didn't do their job, those churches could fail. Those churches could fail. They were on a mission. Matthew 24. So why bring them up now? Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew 24. Familiar scripture. The familiar chapter. Matthew 24, verse 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. I almost wonder in the mind of Peter and Paul and John, and the rest of the apostles. They were living this in their mind. They did ask before Christ went to the Father, at this time, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? They're waiting. Is this going to happen? He says, it's not time for you to know, the, you know the, God, the Father's way, the Father's timeline. And I'm paraphrasing that, but that's what he was telling them. It's not for you to know right now. But you go wait in Jerusalem, and you wait for the promise. You go wait. And you'll have something that, you know, a gift, and you have a mission to do. You have a mission. The elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now I go back to the question I asked, can you imagine if the elect hadn't been called throughout history? This is part of God's plan. To call out ones that he sees that are fit to receive that spirit and that power from on high. Matthew 24, 22 still. As I did last week, I want to do a couple scriptures. We're almost done, but a couple scriptures as I come. I want to read in the message version. Matthew 24, verse 22. But as we're thinking about that, that responsibility, some people would buckle under that responsibility. But we just read a whole bunch of scriptures. I will be with you. You have this. You have this. Trust me. I will get you where you need to be. It says in Matthew 20, uh, excuse me, Matthew 24, verse, I'm going to start in 21 in the message version. It says, this is, going to be, this is going to be trouble on a scale beyond what the world has ever seen or will see again. If these days of trouble were left to run their course, nobody would make it. But on account of God's chosen people, the trouble will be cut short. The great promise that he made to his people. The ones that he's called out to do a job. Numbers 16. Numbers 16. Numbers chapter 16 deals with Korah's rebellion against God and against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. It 
And Numbers 16 says in verse 44, Numbers 16, verse 44, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. They were praying for the, rebel the rebels. They were praying for those that were going against God. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Aaron stood between and stopped that plague. And God blessed that. That plague to be stopped. He stood, Aaron stood in between. He risked his life to save the life of others. Just as, to me, that's a, just a great example that we have. Even of people that rebelled against God and did not want to do what God told them to do. And that reminds me of Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, verse 26. A question that the Lord God asks. Ezekiel 22, verse 26. He says, her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. Her princes and her mists are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Sounds familiar. Her prophets black plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and div divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord had not spoken. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads. Says the Lord God. God was looking for somebody that would stand up for righteousness. Stand in that hole in the wall. And defend. Righteousness. And defend the truth. But in, a, in that physical sense, he could find no one. And the city fell. We just saw in Matthew 24, spiritually, he's looking for that again. For those days will be shortened for the elect's sake. Spiritually, he is looking for his people to stand the gap. To stand between living and death. To stand tall. Even in this, you know, we see the world. We see the world. And it, we continue, every day, a little bit crumbles, a little bit more crumbles. It, that's, that's what happens. We've read it. When man trusts man's own wisdom. All the stuff... I read today is to encourage us, to guide us, to keep us going, just like Paul did and Peter. And we can read in John's letters. We can read in the Acts of the Apostles. 
the apostles going out with a mission. Trust God. Trust your Savior, Jesus Christ. It says in the message version, Ezekiel 22, just I'm going to start in verse 30. I looked for someone to stand up for me against all this. I looked for someone to stand up for me against all this. To repair the defenses of the city, to take a stand for me. And stand in the gap to protect this land so I wouldn't have to destroy it. We have been called to spiritually stand the gap. He is asking, will you stand up for me? Will you stand up for my righteousness? And as we read, and I'm sure it's going to be talked about later in, today in the services and tomorrow, we have the Spirit of God that he has given us to guide us, to direct us, to help us, to fortify us, to stand that gap. May God continue to strengthen us in our journey that we're on as we cry aloud and prepare the way for our Lord, our King, and our Savior.